So uh, my name is Rob Clark. I'm the uh, lead security architect for HP Cloud. Uh, I've been with Hewlett Packard for three and a half ish years. Um, a distinguished technologist in the cloud group and been responsible for, for most of the uh, security work that we've been doing there. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit before I get going just about the OpenStack security group. Um, we've been doing a hell of a lot of work in the last two or three years to improve the state of security in OpenStack. Um, we've got membership from right across all the, all the big players and a lot of the smaller players and independent people uh, involved in OpenStack today. Um, we're involved in a whole bunch of different initiatives. Um, we wrote the uh, OpenStack security guide. Uh, we issue OpenStack security notes, which are pieces of security guidance, a little bit like advisories, but um, they're more little gotchas in, in OpenStack, things that might cause you to end up deploying things insecurely unless you're careful, things like that. Uh, we work on threat analysis, which we'll talk to you more about uh, in a talk later on today. Uh, we've been working a bit on static analysis. Um, so if you guys go and have a look on Stackforge for a project called Bandit, you'll find something that'll point out some of the things you've done wrong in your Python, which is pretty cool because there isn't really any decent static analysis, security-oriented static analysis stuff for Python, so that's pretty cool. Um, we continue to grow. We're easy enough to find through Google. Um, if you're interested in security or anything we talk about today, then please you know, come drop us a mail, join the group, and uh, get involved in the conversation. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about OpenStack. Some of these uh, next few slides might be uh, familiar to some of you. In fact, one person in the room stole these slides. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges for securing OpenStack. So OpenStack seems relatively simple. We have a couple of services. If we apply sort of fairly standard security approaches to, to locking it down, we can understand where our different data flows have to be. We can create little walled gardens, create little protected areas where our HA stuff can talk to one another and all the underlying services can interact. Make sure all our data paths run across them. And uh, yeah, OpenStack is secure. Everyone can go home, close down the security group. Good job. Unfortunately, yeah, I should, it, this deck should have come with a sarcasm warning. Unfortunately, um, OpenStack isn't quite as simple as that. Um, you end up with a lot more data paths. So you end up needing messaging for just about everything. You end up needing billing for everything. Even if you're not monetizing your cloud, you need to know how people are using it. You end up with lots of different interconnected services. The walled garden model doesn't work so brilliantly when everything has to talk to everything else. Um, in fact, it just doesn't work. So we can't use walled gardens. We can't very easily use network segregation. Uh, you can attempt to use ACLs, but on large deployments, you may actually overrun the ACL tables on the hardware you're using. Um, Software-based network stuff isn't really there for us yet, so we have to go with a different approach. So one of the things you, we considered doing was uh, encrypting as many of the individual connections as possible. Most OpenStack services you can put behind TLS. Um, the ones that you can't, you can a lot of the time position behind a, a TLS terminator that will, will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about TLS. Um, but basically, we ran into a few problems. Uh, so deploying TLS isn't very hard. People have been doing it for a long time. Um, deploying TLS and, and managing all the certificates that are in there can be quite tricky. So TLS provides us with two things. Um, it provides us with confidentiality, and it provides us with message integrity. And it, from a slightly higher level, it provides you with some measure of authentication as well, because you know who you're talking to. Notice I'm not saying SSL TLS. I'm just saying TLS. Anyone who still says SSL gets poodles thrown at them. So uh, it's, it's, you know, the technology has come a long way from secure sockets layer being a weird thing that Netscape were working on that was horribly broken to a thing that the community that was working on that was horribly broken. And then we come through TLS um, up through to sort of 1.0, 1.1. Um, basically, everything you're doing should be at least TLS 1.1. Some people will want to use 1.0 for um, compatibility reasons. Uh, so, you know, you make your choices. 
um, TLS, SSL, or you know, it generally pivots on X509 certificates. You're generally using uh, V3 certificates. Um, they provide you with um, a bunch of things. So you get a certificate, and I'm just doing a quick review here. Uh, you can tell who it was issued by, whether it's issued by somebody you trust, and it has a bunch of properties like um, you can have your fully qualified domain name in there, subject alternative names for different machines that might need to use the same certificate. Uh, describe how to check revocation. I should have a big circle around it for this talk. Um, describe how the cert can be used when it's valid from and to. Um, so when people normally talk about a certificate authority, they're actually talking about two things. Generally, they're talking about a registration authority and a certificate authority. So just quickly, who's ever sort of had to request a certificate from VeriSign or Symantec or something like that, right? Okay, you create a CSR, blah, 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 send it off. And then you have to fill out a form that says who you are and what company you work for and why they should give you the certificate that says robhp.com, whatever. When you're putting in all that information, you're talking to the registration authority. The, the RA is who decides or what decides whether or not you should be given a certificate. The CA is relatively simple. It signs a certificate, makes an entry in a database to remember it's given you a certificate and you know put you on their mailing list and stuff. Um, but the RA actually does a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of, in terms of the actual trust that needs to go into the certificate in terms of I mean, what, what, a, what a certificate authority and an RA do is assert that you are who you say you are. And they give you a certificate that says, I am who I say I am. This person has verified it. You should trust me. So you request a certificate. You fill out a CSR. Send it off. Um, so when you're doing it internally, and actually at more, ups, more uh, commercial CAs than perhaps people would like to admit, a lot of the time there's a, um, you know, there's a person on the other end applying a script <laughs> literally following a script on one screen, making sure that the data matches on another, going through, performing various manual checks. And this is often, like I say, an individual. On a corporate scale, um, policies can be difficult to implement sometimes. They tend to be fairly corporate in nature, so uh, they might not be specific to the applications you're trying to deploy. Um, like I say, these people are f normally following a script, and if you look at, say, all the people here that are deploying private clouds um, or even hybrid clouds. Uh, the person who's administering your certificate authority and acting as your RA or as the human that underpins your RA, um, it's probably not their day job. In, part, in fact, it's probably one of the parts of their job that they s hate the most. And you don't want to trust all the crypto assurance in your platform to somebody who hates the job that they're doing. So after a certificate has been issued, um, it may turn out that a certificate's not required anymore. It may need to be revoked. Um, like I say, PK admins generally hate their jobs. Um, they have a lot of power in the organization. Um, the RA and, and things should have a decent audit stream, but how often it's checked it is you know, sometimes questionable. Um, the person managing that platform does have the power to create certificates for star.com that will be recognized by everybody that trusts the uh, CA, certificate stapling and things aside. Um, and a couple of years later, if everything hasn't broken already, um, the certificate expires and you didn't have a system in place to deal with it, and that has broken more people's organizations than people would admit. Um, revocation. So I'm not sure if anyone is like a SciShow fan, but I don't think that means what you think it means. Um, or to put it another way, Revocation doesn't work for how we try and use it. The only places where revocation works well right now are in browsers. Um, if you look at all the Python libraries we're trying to use, um, sometimes they'll implement CRLs. Uh, if you try, um, so let's back up slightly. So certificate revocation works in one of two ways, really. Um, certificate revocation lists, which are signed lists of certificates that should no longer be trusted because they've been lost, compromised, something like that. Um, CRL stopped being used as a sort of a general web technology a number of years ago. You won't find, if you open up any of your distros, any of your laptops up, look on there for your CRL list, you won't find it. It's not there for any of the, any of the uh, certificate authorities you trust. And that's because they got massive and huge and too bulky to distribute. So um, the online certificate status protocol uh, is a UDP-based 
lightweight protocol. You can send off a message to a machine saying, uh, do I trust this certificate or should I continue to trust this certificate? And you'll get a sort of a yes, no, come back later type response from them. And that's cryptographically signed. And that information, um, the o o OCSP responder is in the certificate that you're trying to check, so you can look that up. Unfortunately, the libraries that we use in OpenStack and most client-based SSL libraries don't do OCSP very well at all. It's not, it's, it's great for web browsers. Generally, they tend to support it. Um, but a lot of the time, they don't. I want to talk a little bit now about the kind of infrastructure you need to do um, high availability PKI generally uh, for something like OpenStack. So simple PKI, you have your root certificate, intermediate, intermediates below, and then various servers using the certificates. This looks reasonably familiar to people, right? OK. Except normally, you need your intermediate certificate authorities to have some measure of availability. So you need to replicate them, and they use a database or some sort of RPC between to make sure that they maintain state and they know what's going on with certificates. Um, if you want to do CRL or OCSP responders, they all need to hang off the same database as well. Your database becomes a single point of failure, so you need to replicate that. And uh, you need to replicate your responders in your different availability zones, and then you end up with more intermediate. And it just gets kind of messy. Um, when you end up having lots and lots of servers, so take this as a private cloud. You've got many, many servers. Um, your, your PKI admin is going to be very, very unhappy if you're trying to provide three or four certificates for every machine in there. Um, so it's infrastructure heavy. Licensing can be very expensive. So if we look at that, if we're using a proprietary certificate stack, like if you're using ADCS or some of the other uh, certificate um, trust services available, then um, cost can get quite high. Uh, the life cycle can be kind of messy. Um, if you take any one of those services and, and look sort of a year down the road, you can tell what certificates were issued and when, but you don't know what's still required, what's in use. You don't know if the machines that you gave those certificates to still exist. You don't know if the admins who have those certificates have done bad things with them. And you can't make assertions about the life cycle of the private key that was used to generate the certificate re request in the first place. Um, so scale is hard. As far as we're concerned, we don't trust the revocation stuff that's there. And it, it's very difficult to, to make it work. So um, we decided to have a look at a redesign of how we would do certificate provisioning and revocation. Uh, we were going to do this using only the existing libraries with all the faults that they have. We wanted to make it simple and, and kind of make it feel like OpenStack. And um, we wanted to make it open source. Uh, so the reason I've added lots of humor in here is because I'm about to get onto how we did it, and lots of people won't like it. So, <laughs> so we start with one fundamental thing that was borne out by our testing, which is that revocation is broken and expiry isn't. That is to say that revocation in the types of systems we try to deploy and protect with TLS doesn't work as well as we'd like it to. We don't consider it to provide us with a high assurance model. Expiry generally works pretty well in every library we've found. Obviously, it requires times to be relatively accurate. So we designed a system that we're referring to as ephemeral PKI, and we have an ephemeral CA. And the whole system pivots on us giving out very short lifetime certificates. So we give you certificates that are measured in hours rather than years. When you do that, your, your uh, certificate admin's head explodes because he's now getting N thousand requests every few hours for all the machines that need certificates. I'm going to go through a little bit more how that works. Um, but it gives you a few interesting properties. Um, we, we end up with a system that we can scale really well. It scales in the same way that you scale everything else in OpenStack. Um, it can be siloed, so it can be deployed, and revocation will still work in low connectivity environments. So you no longer need to have centralized certificate management and replicate OCSP responders everywhere or create RPC interconnects so that different bits of your data centers can talk to one another. We have a diode audit stream. So I mentioned a few times that this system is kind of stateless. Um, one fun fact that people won't like, it doesn't know who it gave a certificate to. Doesn't know, doesn't care, doesn't need to. 
Um, it does have an audit stream, so we will know. We always know who was given a certificate and when, but the system doesn't rely on that to give out certificates. So we accept that this is um, a kind of an interesting way of approaching things, um, and it requires you to accept a couple of things, and we get a hell of a lot of benefits out of it. And what I'm going to do, instead of trying to tell you all about it now, I'm going to run through a little bit of how it works. Um, I've not had... Uh, there's a lot of interesting deployment modes you can use with this. I'm going to run through the, some of the more basic ways you can do it and um, hopefully convince some of you that this isn't <coughs> as scary as you might think. So we have a very simple software stack. We have a REST interface, PCOM-based uh, API, just as you would expect in OpenStack. Um, we have a pluggable authentication layer. We have a... Um, uh, decision engine, so whereas your human RA sits there and looks at the information you provided and runs through their little flowchart, we, we figured that you know, scripting is a thing, so we went down that road instead. Um, and then we have a certificate authority, which unfortunately, because of some of the challenges with um, M2 Crypto, uh, currently relies on a slightly modified version of the library, which is something that I'm hoping Paul and his friends will fix for us in the very near future. Good job. So in our, this is going to be in the most simple configuration. So think about this in a dev test environment. Or actually think of it in a dev stack environment. So one of the things we can do with Ephemeral is because it's a very lightweight stack and doesn't require anything that isn't kind of open stack to work, you could deploy it into dev stack if you wanted to and actually have full certificate services running inside a dev stack. So a CSR gets created, and we do this on the server using Certmunga. So we've written um, an extension plugin-y thing for Certmunga, so it can talk to Ephemeral PKI. Um, and so Certmunga creates, in this system, we'll create a new private key and create a CSR, and send it to uh, send it to our server along with some authentication information. The REST interface receives it, punts it to the authentication system. Authentication says, "Yep, that's fine." Punts it to the decision engine applies a bunch of interest, a bunch of different rules. Now the rules are written, they can be as pervasive or as restrictive as you want. They can check as many things and reach out to as many other systems as you need them to. Um, so one of the things we can do here in an automated way, uh, so your decision engine, let's say um, a certificate comes through for, for Nova. Um, you can go away and check CMDB and check that the reverse DNS, so you get the IP for the FQDN that was provided by the system that was saying it was Nova. And if that resolves to something else, if that turns out to be a machine that you created with the purpose of being a Swift box or the Horizon interface or something like that, then you can say, no, go away. I'm not going to talk to you again. Um, if it passes all the checks, the certificate authority will sign it. You get back your certificate. So plug-in authentication. Um, in its most simple form, we can just use shared secrets. So if you've got a small deployment and you just want to have TLS operating between the different points because you want to do that. Uh, so if it's uh, sort of a testing environment or a very small deployment, you can use shared secrets. They're not great, but you can't pretend that's not how OpenStack configures everything right now. So um, at the very least, it's idiomatic. Uh, <laughs> we, can do LD we can do LDAP lookups. So you can, if you have service accounts for your machines, we can do LDAP lookups, and we can constrain them based on various groups. So again, if machines, if your service accounts are grouped into Nova or grouped into whatever, then you can check. And if a request is coming from a Swift box for a Nova certificate, then you know that you shouldn't give them a certificate. Um, you know, if we're using Keystone for identity, we've been looking at how you might use it with a Keystone service. There's a, some potential for chicken and egg type problems there, depending on how far you want to extend the use of ephemeral PKI. But um, it is capable today of talking to Keystone and getting back uh, authentication information. Reverse DNS verification. This is something that pro you know people wouldn't normally do. So it will get a get a certificate, and um, if it gets a certificate, because obviously it's getting certificates from the machines that request them. So if it gets a certificate from a machine, um, it'll open the FQ open up the uh, certificate, have a look at the um, the the name that's been requested. It'll do a DNS lookup, get the IP, and then it'll check the, the log from the RESTful 
interface to find out which machine requested it. And if the requester came from a different IP to, the, to what the FQDN resolves to, then you can have it configured to not give out a certificate for that. Now that's 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 pretty cool. That's not something you can you know, normally do with PKI easily. Um, CMDB system. Well, I mentioned this already. Uh, reversed IP in valid ranges, so it can check that it it can be told how big your OpenStack deployment is, what IPs have been given to it. If something outside of OpenStack is requesting certificates, um, then it will know that. You can check names match schemes. So I've spoke a bit about authentication. It will know. Um, it can know. What, uh, what roles different machines play in the system when they request certificates. Um, and you can set rules for what certificates or what domain names look like for machines in different roles. So if you have a prefix or a naming scheme, now OpenStack's never had a solid naming scheme, which is a bit of a, bit of a problem. Um, but if you have an agreed naming scheme for your deployment, which you probably do, this can enforce it. So it'll only give out certificates that fit within a, with a naming scheme. So in Nova, it might be NV dash whatever. And you can check prefix and uh, postfixes for that. And it's an extendable rule set. I mentioned, um, I mentioned it's stateless, but we do have basically have a, a, a one-way output to your given audit server, which is really cool. Because what that allows me to do is say, I want to know, let's say we have a 24-hour life cycle, life cycle on a certificate. I want to know exactly which machines have a certificate that is valid to be used today in my entire environment. I, I can know that. If we have a problem like Heartbleed, which was a problem for a lot of people, um, the correct response to that was to assume that all of your certificates, all of your private keys were compromised. With this system, we'd have to update OpenSSL to the unaffected version and then wait. For our, peer, for our timeout on our certificates. And we have a cryptographically verifiable, non-heartbleed affected, private key protected system within whatever our certificate window is. And that's it, that's how it works. It's, you know, it, it's easy. Heartbleed, you know, I lost a lot of nights over that stuff and we wouldn't have done if we'd had this deployed today. We probably would have lost sleep on other things if we'd had this deployed today, but never mind. Because it operates in the, a very open stack flavored way, you can load balance it the same way you, you load balance anything else in OpenStack. Um, because it's stateless, the two, two systems don't need to talk to each other. They just need to be able to talk to an audit system where they just dump it out. So that's whatever your security event, incident management, or whatever you want to do. Um, the rule sets can be customizable depending on deployment. <coughs> so when you think about having a, a certificate authority for OpenStack, you think about having something central that everything talks to. And you can do that, and you can write rules that explain to one or one, um, one HA deployment of ephemeral CA. You can have rules that say how your entire cloud is supposed to work. But that can be quite tricky. I mean, we operate a pretty big OpenStack-based public cloud, and you know, our Nova guys don't. <laughs> we have different teams that have different priorities and different challenges. So what we can do is we can let them build their own rule sets for their own deployment of their PKI. Uh, so what you end up with then is you may have um, ephemeral CA running for Nova and ephemeral CA running for Swift, for Neutron. And they provide all the certificates for all the services that need to interact within, within that service, or so within Nova or within Swift. Um, those teams would be responsible for, for writing those rule sets. And we, and like I, I work on the security team at HP, we, we would review those rule sets as part of the operational security review for that service that we do periodically. Um, but that gives them some freedom to get really creative and you know, get <laughs> score bonus points by, by putting in really clever rules and checks. Um, it also means that when they have their own ephemeral CA, they'll only have that trust anchor installed within that service. So only Nova machines will respect the Nova CA. Only Swift machines will respect the Swift CA. So if there is a rule failure, say, within Swift, things break, people get things wrong. If anyone thinks that doesn't happen with security stuff, then uh, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> so with localized trust anchors, um, it means that uh, if Swift has a certificate failure, they wrote a rule wrong. Somebody breaks into Swift through some other mechanism, figures out, hey, there's this cool thing, and manages to get us get a certificate for for something else, for star.google.com or 
or Nova dot whatever. Um, they could only they could only compromise what was going on inside Swift because that trust anchor isn't installed on any of the other machines in any of the other services. So you can have localized rule sets, localized exposure of compromise, which is again pretty cool. You can't localize those sorts of things without deploying entirely separate PKI stacks normally. Um, unfortunately. If you do that, you also have plenty of services in OpenStack that need to talk to each other in secure ways. So you still need a high level um, instance of the ephemeral CA so that um, Nova can talk to, say, Glance when it needs to pull down images or do stuff like that. Uh, and the way we would do that is uh, we just simply have a stricter set of rules written for, for the high level CA. Um, so I need to apologize a little bit for the, for the timing and for some of these slides. Uh, I was supposed to be presenting this with a colleague, so I have, I have no idea how far through we are or not. Um, status today, Authn works with LDAP, Keystone, um, DNS IP based rule sets. You have basic group based rule sets. Um, the code is about to be released re for review. And this and everything else that we will put out upstream like this will come with AppArmor profiles. Um, any of you that want to take them and turn them into SE Linux, that would be great. I'm not going to do it. Uh, so next steps. So this kind of stands on its own at the moment, but there's no reason it can't stand behind Barbican as another way, another place of getting certificates. I've already spoken to the Barbican guys about the fact that um, our system is slightly different to a typical certificate requesting system. So you ask for a certificate, you give it your information, and you either get a certificate back or you you get a knack, go away, we don't like you. Um, so there isn't this period of submitting a certificate, waiting for it to go through the RA process and come back to you. Um, and I think we've worked out that that will be OK, maybe with a few tweaks. Um, I'd like to see this adopted by the security group um, and make it a security group project that we can sort of continue to develop along with the people already working at HP. Obviously, additional rule sets and authentication methods. Um, so, what we have designed is a system. We have short life certificates. Um, we issue typically would look at sort of a 12-hour window. That seems to work well in our testing and doesn't break any individual operations in OpenStack. Um, some services deal very well with having their certificates replaced by CertMonger because CertMonger is going to sit there behind whatever your service is doing, and it's going to rip a certificate out and put another one in there and hope you don't notice. <laughs> some some services do notice and, and they, they get very upset. Um, so for them, we, we're generally looking at placing them behind whatever your favorite TLS load balancer bit of software is. Um, Pound is really nice for doing this and other things as well. Um, and they're generally very resilient to having their certificates swapped around because they're meant to work over many, many years, and we're just doing it over a few hours. So in, uh, in a system where you have, a let's say, a 24-hour certificate lifecycle, um, we'd recommend we would have our CertMonger systems configured to request a new certificate probably every eight hours. Um, so you still have that maximum permissible period where a bad certificate could be used, which is not great. But um, like I say, revocation doesn't work. And even if you're using OCSP, um, your OCSP responses are probably stapled, and they're probably 24-hour or 12-hour windows anyway. So we're really looking at a parity system. Um, the reason you request more often is because if, for some reason, the ephemeral CA has decided that it hates you, it gives you another 16 hours in this example to um, raise an alert and to have an admin come and work out why the ephemeral CA hates you uh, before your system starts to fall down. Because we are talking about, you know, if something went horribly, horribly wrong with the ephemeral CA, or if you wrote your rules wrong, everything could, you know, stop working within 24 hours if, if everything stopped getting certificates. Which is great. Actually, what you'd find, unfortunately, with a lot of OpenStack is it would carry on working because the certificate validation on the other end doesn't work so well. But we're going to carry on working on that. Um, but yeah, so key points. Kind of fixes provisioning. Kind of fixes revocation. Stateless. Scales really nicely. Open source. Easy to deploy. Uh, questions? You could absolutely do that. We, we, we chose, throughout all of this, the design principle has been to not try to be clever. Right, but that's, I mean, that's yeah. 
It is, yeah. I mean, so another reason we stayed away from message queues is because message queue security it continues to be a horribly broken thing in OpenStack. Um, this is a nice, easy way of doing things. I have absolutely no objection to looking at a message queue model for for, for managing certificate lifecycle, getting things to and from the ephemeral CAs. No problem with it at all. Uh, the, uh, the, so the question was, what's the um, validity of the CA and uh, how does that get changed? Um, so we kind of punted on that a little bit to say it's, it's basically the same. So whenever you deploy a trust anchor, you make a, a risk managed decision around how long that trust anchor is going to live. Um, and we don't take any more responsibility for that than you would in an, any, any other PKI system. Um, in terms of distribution, we assume that you are using some um, configuration platform to do this, so you're using Chef or Puppet or Ansible Salt. You're doing something like that that manages these little bits of nitty gritty, which is also how you would need to get the trust anchors onto the boxes in the first place. Um, but of course, the trust anchors aren't, they're not cryptographically sensitive. Um, you know, if you, if you fiddle with them, they won't work. So, you know, there are lots of open ways we can deploy them to machines. So, uh, if someone's got ideas around sort of how to manage that bit of the life cycle, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to to talk about them, but uh, but yeah, good question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so this is similar to some of the early discussions on message queue security. Has this been considered uh, maybe, maybe plugging into that and using this to provide certificates for message queue? We've not had a conversation about it. So did everybody hear the question? Um, the the question was. Uh, this is kind of similar to some of the early discussions around how to fix message queue security um, to do with uh, how how to provide um, cryptographic and uh, s strong integrity stuff around around messages on the uh, on RPC and OpenStack. Nowadays, we refer to that as kite. We've got a couple of kite guys here. Um, I can see where there would be overlap. I think it's a good thing to point out. It's not a conversation that we've had. Um, although one of the guys involved with Kite is also involved with ephemeral PKI, so some arm twisting could probably be done. Yeah. So how do you manage certificate IDs in a stateless world? You don't. You trust your rule sets to make sure that the right certificates have been delivered to people. Um, we just, at the moment, we do them randomly. I can't remember if we hash on the last one or something, but we don't. Um, we don't care about the certificate IDs that go out, because certificate management generally is done so badly. I mean, one of the reasons we accept a certain period, you know, we say, well, revocation kind of doesn't work anyway. So we accept a certain period where it won't work. And we accept that because, you know, I think one of the largest challenges for organizations is actually um, dealing with all the unused certificates and all the other stuff that, that's knocking around. Um, so we know in our audit stream exactly what certificate ID was given to what box, when, and why. So it's all in the audit stream if you need to, you know, if you've got a forensic investigation where you see a, a weird certificate's been used somewhere. You can look in your, um, in your scene platform and see exactly what machine that certificate was given to, when it was given to them, why, how they authenticated. You can see all that in the audit stream. But that's based on certificate ID. Uh, so we're talking about the, like, the certificate fingerprint, right? Serial numbers? So yeah, serial yeah, numbers. Serial numbers, so Yeah. But yeah, that's all we do. So, um, you know, we have n number of certificates. We know the life of the certificate is, is actually very short, so we're not really very worried about collisions in that space. But we, yeah, we only pivot on the fingerprint. So, yes. It's a very good question. So um, I think there's really two points to that. Um, the first one, you know, is response time deterministic? I would say whatever the HTTP timeout is. You know, it either will give you a backer certificate or it won't, or your connection will fail. Ideally, it, it either decides yes or no very quickly. The other is around external workflow. Um, so while we don't have external workflow in the way that you would have in a normal PKI system where um, you know, there may be additional verification steps like you would have if you went and got a public certificate today. Um, 
there are opportunities f for issues where, you know, if you, when you talk to the CMDB system, if that's hanging for some reason, you don't want things to hang all the way down. Um, so we just have sensible timeouts for a lot of that stuff, um, which again is why we recommend, you know, if you're using 24 hour or you're using 12 hour certificates, send a new request every sort of third of that time period. So you're always grabbing a new certificate before the old one runs out. Um, because if the machine doesn't get a certificate or raise an alert through whatever your monitoring platform is, Isinga, whatever, that'll pop up in whatever your operations room is and someone will go and look up why a certificate wasn't granted. And then they can have a look in the audit log and see, well, this exact request came from this machine and it turns out someone didn't update CMDB so we no it didn't know about the machine anymore, which is great because that doesn't normally happen. Normally what happens is you get drift of all these systems. I don't really want our PKI platform to be what in <laughs> enforces sort of compliance to how people should be doing CMDB and other things, but at the end of the day, if you want a well-configured system that hangs together properly, that's how it has to be. Sorry, no, go, go ahead and no, then go to the back. Uh, I wouldn't say any that we're happy with releasing right now, only just stuff that's been kind of hacked together to make it work. Um, we've been kind of, uh, so PKI, having ephemeral CA in DevStack helps. There are still other bits that don't work very nicely with certificates in DevStack. So I know some of the Nebula guys, I know some of Brian's guys have been working on improving um, how services use certificates in, in DevStack. Um, so hopefully we can bring some of that together and then we will have better examples of how to do some of this stuff. Uh, yeah, the back. Uh, I didn't talk to that point. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that we could do with the uh, ephemeral PKI is to um, have it start talking to, to HSMs to provide some of the cryptographic operations. Now, the scope of a compromise in the PKI platform depends on the type of compromise. If someone compromises it at sort of the logic layer, then they may be able to get past a rule set and issue a bad certificate, which is the same for any PKI platform. If they were able to get sort of a, high, a more elevated presence within the platform, then perhaps they could get to the private key or whatever we're using for, for the root cert on there. And then just like if they did that on any other PKI platform, they'd basically be able to issue certificates that be trusted by other things. Um, so one of the things we can do there is we can offload a lot of that responsibility into the HSM, which makes people feel all warm and fuzzy, except all it really does is moves the problem because the HSM still trusts whatever your PKI platform is, which is why people get excited about HSMs. You have to calm them down because your, your HSM still trusts the machine that got compromised and will perform whatever key operations you want. The only perhaps benefit you get is you get a more trustable audit stream from the HSM. So you at least know what happened when and can trust that that hasn't been tampered by whoever was tamp tampering the PKI device. So, I mean, we have a bunch of KMIP code written that we're working on Barbican. We'll have a bunch of KMIP code for Barbican we're working on anyway. Um, we're, we're looking at contributing to the PY KMIP library that the APL guy has been doing. I know some of you here, thank you for that. Um, it's great. It's not, I, don't, I think, all the way it needs to be, but it's awesome that someone's taken it that far and we will help it get further. Um, so yeah, you know, we'll, we'll use it. Definitely, we'll make it an option, but we, it doesn't have to be used because this is supposed to enable PKI right the way through all types of OpenStat deployment. Cool. Any more questions? No, oh, brilliant. Thank you for. Oh. So, so that's that's a very good point. I mean, one of the initial problems this was designed to fix was um, PKI administrators don't scale very well, and they get bored, and they get grumpy, and they go off and do other things. Um, unfortunately, if this is a very successful system, say you've got a cloud of 10,000 nodes, you're probably getting at least 10,000 certificate requests, probably somewhere in the order of double that, and if you're extending this for um, instances as well, then you know that could go up by a factor of 10 or something like that. Um, I believe it will scale. 
um, because it's just based on very simple web technology. And the whole point of this is we're not trying to be clever. We built it using PGON. If you can scale your OpenStack APIs, you should be able to scale this. Um, at the end of the day, if you have scale challenges like that, you're probably prepared to put money behind the scale challenges, which means you know you put a TLS accelerated load balancer in front of it or something, and your scale problems go away until you need to spend more money. Unfortunately, that's how scale works, right? You don't get everything for free just through software. You have to do some difficult things sometimes. So yeah, it's a problem I'd love to have. Um, I'm sure we can solve it in a bunch of different ways. Uh, it's definitely something you need to be aware of. If you just try and deploy this on like one machine and then stand it up in a massive data center, then you may have a bad day, but you'd probably have that same bad day for any s other central service you were trying to deploy in that sort of scenario. Cool. Anyone? Awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate all your time. <laughs>